Ann Ball, Program Director at Maine Development Foundation, and you are in uh, session two, Maine's uh, Sustainably Managed Forest and Climate Change. And I'm here today with um, moderator uh, Aaron Weiss-Kittle. And Aaron is a professor of forest biometrics and modeling, Irving Chair of Forest Ecosystem Management at the University of Maine. Thanks for being with us, Aaron. And then um, I will do my best on name pronunciations. Uh, Peter Triandafilu. Yay. Um, <laughs> Peter uh, recently retired as the Vice President of Woodlands for Huber Resource Corporation. And HRC is a timberland management firm based in Old Town, Maine. HRC manages approximately 800,000 acres of timberland and in Maine and in five other states. And Peter has invo been involved in several statewide wood supply modeling projects for the state of Maine and has modeled client timberlands over three decades. Peter serves on the board of MFPC, Farm Credit East, ACA, and Farm Credit Council. Peter holds a BA in biology from Columbia College and an MS in forestry from SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry and is a licensed Maine forester. Thank you, Peter, for being with us and serving on our panel. And Adam Dagno, hopefully I said that right. Um, Adam, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dagno joined the SFR faculty in 2016 as an assistant professor of forest Recreation and Conservation Policy, and Head of the Humane Forest Policy and Economics Lab. He received a PhD in Environmental and Natural Resources Economics from Ohio State University and has spent the past decade developing quantitative models to assess the socioeconomic impacts of environmental policy on the natural resource sectors. His research has focused on a wide range of issues, including freshwater management, climate change mitigation and adaptation, invasive species control, and valuing ecosystem services. Prior to joining SFR, Dr. Dagno was a senior economist at Land Care Research, New Zealand's leading institute on terrestrial ecosystems and biodiversity research and an economist for the US Environmental Protection Agency where he worked extensively on policy analysis relating to climate change, biofuels and land use change. And then our last panelist, Brian Sewers is the owner and president of Treeline Inc. Brian started the business in 1981 with a chainsaw and a horse. Since then, the company has grown to a high of 90 employees over 200 trucks, trailers, service vehicles, and heavy equipment, three large maintenance shops, a small sawmill, a concentration wood yard, and a supply store. Before Brian started Treeline, he worked as a forester for International Paper Company. He studied forestry at the New York State School of Forestry, spending one year at Syracuse University and a second year at the New York State Ranger School, focused on technical training. And since then, Brian has kept his passion for forest management, leading Treeline to become and remain master logger certified since 2002. Treeline offers a wide range of forest-based products and services to the surrounding towns and communities that it serves. So those are our distinguished panelists and uh, our moderator today. So I am going to uh, turn it over to the team and I will keep track of time and I will also um, monitor the chat. Well, thank you, Anne. Uh, obviously, we have a very distinguished uh, committee that represents the diversity of Maine's forest and the importance of it. Um, I will only set some context here and then turn it over to those. So I think as we heard in many of the earlier talks, um, Maine has a vast resource that supports a very sustainable and, and diverse economy. Um, but obviously it relies on a sustainably managed in this resource and there are plenty of challenges that affect a natural resource, um, which makes it different than many other industries and I think that's important to recognize. Uh, a lot of issues, uh, I think one of the first things that we worked on with the four main effort um, was a wood supply analysis uh, to project and look forward into what will become available and what factors may influence that. 
a lot of things that we're thinking about right now and uh, might be climate change, uh, might be invasive species, it might be spruce budworm, uh, it might also be just the workforce. Um, and I think that's kind of what uh, we're thinking about. Within the University of Maine Center for Research and Sustainable Forests, we work directly with the stakeholders and land managers to help them provide the tools and the knowledge that they need to sustainably manage the forest. We've also done things such as uh, the state's carbon budget to assess the importance of forest for the overall carbon emissions profile of the state. And we are currently running a monthly webinar on science and practices related to climate change. Uh, so this is a big topic um, and a lot to cover in the next few minutes. And I really appreciate everyone joining us. And again, I hope this is a, a dynamic dialogue um, that we can continue um, now as well as after this. So with that, Peter, I turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you, Aaron. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, and then put it in slideshow. Can, can everyone see my screen? Looks good, Aaron, Peter. Sounds like. Um, it doesn't see, there we go. And we're, now we're in slideshow mode. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Um, I have 10 minutes to go through this wood supply analysis, so obviously I'm gonna be skipping over a few things, but I'd be happy to catch up with folks um, afterwards. Um, first of all, I wanna thank our committee this is the group that worked on reviewing the, the work that was done by our contractors, uh, Sewell Company. These are all folks that I've known, colleagues that I've known for a very long time, and I'm grateful for their work, uh, which isn't over because what I'm presenting today is still preliminary and the committee uh, needs to review the final work and the final report. So what, what, what do we do here? What, what is it, right? The, the model that we put together was a way, it's an overview of sustainable wood supply in Maine compared to current consumption. Um, I could, I'll go through the details perhaps in a little bit, but we, we figured out how much wood is being consumed in Maine by broad species groups and built a model to project that, uh, that or harvest forward to see if it's sustainable or not. We had, the idea is if we're gonna expand our industry, is the wood there to sustain it? It is valid for statewide or regional estimates. So it's a fairly coarse filter. Um, it's designed to represent the entire state of Maine or mega regions, collections of counties. And it assumes, and this is important, I'll deal with it a little bit more later, it assumes that current forest management continues as is. It does not project big changes in forest management. Uh, it is not certain things. It's not a tool for locating a new uh, facility, for example. It's not a tool you'd use to figure out wood supply within a hundred mile radius of a point. And nor is it applicable for small geographic estimates, but it is uh, a pretty good tool to use for statewide estimates. Very briefly, uh, this is the process we used to put it together. Uh, our contractor that we hired, Sewell Company, started with uh, basic inventories in the state of Maine based on the FIA data. Those are plots that were created by the US Forest Service and are measured and maintained by the Maine Forest Service. We built yield curves that project forest stands forward in time following silvicultural entries. And we modeled uh, silviculture as it's practiced pretty much today, uh, clear cutting, shelter wood entries, overstory removals, commercial thinnings, pre-commercial thinnings, plantations. And this second iteration of this work, uh, we came up with new curves um, to model the kind of harvesting that tends to occur on family wood lots of stuff we heard about uh, just a little while ago if you were in that room. Uh, and also some curves um, that uh, give us an idea of what might happen if the spruce webworm comes back, which it will, although we don't know when. We wanted to do this on a sustainable basis. So uh, this may be a little simplistic, but I think it makes sense. We define sustainability, uh, meaning that at the end of our 50 year projection, the final inventory in the state is no lower than it is today. It has to be the same or higher. So in other words, we can, whatever our model harvest is, it does not drain inventory below where it is today. And uh, we applied discounts for certain landowner classes. I won't go into all the details there, but a good example is, is there's a certain amount of federal timber land in the state, mostly the White Mountain National Forest. It can produce wood and the model projected some wood coming from it. We discounted that to zero. We assumed no wood would be coming from federal lands. Uh, we had similar, although different discounts for state lands for small woodland landowners. And that information will be in the report. 
So I'm going to get right to the details. I'm not going to show you graphs of inventories because there isn't time. So I'm going to show you the three major species groups, groups spruce fir, tolerant hardwoods, um, and other softwood. And I'm going to show you the modeled harvest compared to current consumption. Um, I got to move. There we go. Um, so this is the spruce fir chart. What we're showing here is modeled uh, sustainable harvest levels over the over 50 years, beginning in 2015. So I mentioned earlier we had this is the second phase of doing this work. We started the model up from where we started it the first time around, which is 2015, and we locked harvest there for what actually occurred in that period, which is the black line. So we had roughly a little over three million tons per year of consumption of spruce fir in Maine back then. The model indicates that we have a considerable surplus of spruce and fir fiber going forward based on current management. Um, you can see here the uh, first half of the projection shows approximately, that's, you know, 56, 5.6 million tons. And that goes up in the second part of the projection up to almost 8 million tons per year of available spruce fir fiber. This shouldn't be a big surprise because we have a, a spruce fir forest that's recovering from the previous significant budworm uh, outbreak that occurred uh, in late 70s and early 80s. And that young forest that regenerated following the salvage harvesting and mortality is coming online and, uh, and growing very rapidly. Uh, it's important to take a look at this chart here, the blue, uh, the green bars are assuming no budworm happens. The blue bars assume a uh, relatively mild budworm epidemic, and the um, orange bars give us what happens in a severe budworm epidemic. And I want to thank both Aaron and Jeremy Frank. Uh, they were instrumental, and Jeremy in particular gave us data that helped us model this. Um, the good news on this is that um, uh, uh, even in a severe budworm uh, uh, outbreak, which is the orange bars, we still have a significant surplus of sustainable harvest to, to get from the main forest. It's, it's a lot lower than the situation without a, um, a budworm outbreak, but it's still there. That's, that's good news. The, uh, the di more difficult thing is that if you look at the text box there, the severe outbreak during the height of it, there's as much as 13 million tons of spruce fir per year that could either be lost as mortality or salvaged or some combination thereof. So that would be both an opportunity and a challenge going forward. Um, from my perspective, and this is Peter Tran, the fellow speaking, not I'm not speaking for the whole committee. If history is any guide, uh, we're due sometime soon for a relatively mild budworm outbreak. I don't think the serious outbreak is in the cards in the immediate future. Um, uh, if you look at uh, history, we had a significant and large outbreak in the 1920s, then a very mild outbreak in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, then a big one in the late 70s, early 80s. So we're due for a light one. And the one that happened in the 50s, net growth in the state never went negative. It was just spotty uh, mortality and spotty defoliation. Um, I'm always the optimist, so I'm kind of hoping that's what happens this time around. I don't want to be around for the next really big budworm outbreak, but we model both scenarios. Um, next is hardwood. Um, this is the uh, harvest levels for the same three scenarios of uh, tolerant hardwood. Um, you can see that there is a surplus here. Um, it's not as large as the spruce fir one. This would be something of, on the order of expansion at existing mills, not a big, huge new facility. But the good news here is, is that, uh, again, it is a good news, bad news. When we did the first modeling run, there was not this much of a surplus. There is now because the J mill went down and we're assuming that it's not coming back because that's the latest we have on that. So we have room for expansion, largely due to the loss of that one facility. And then uh, other softwood, this is mostly hemlock um, and then other tamarack and other softwood species. There is a significant surplus here. We're not using very much of this material now. Um, those of us that practice know that getting rid of hemlock pulpwood is uh, never easy. Um, if, you'll, if you look at the y-axis, the numbers are smaller. This is nowhere near the size of a resource of spruce fir or hardwood, but there's a significant amount of it, particularly in central and southern Maine. And, um, um, it's waiting to be used. Some conclusions, and I want to spend a little bit of time here, and I think that will eat up my time, in, but with some time for a few questions, perhaps. Um, first off, under current management, Maine's forests can sustainably support an expanded industry. 
I, 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 I feel very confident looking at those at the modeling that the deltas are large enough that we can say that with pretty good certainty. We can sustainably um, uh, take a much larger far, um, harvest of Maine's, uh, Maine's resource. I should mention that we also model the other species, pine, cedar, and aspen. Those are smaller components of the forest and uh, consumption and supply there are pretty much in balance. But when you look at spruce fir, tolerant hardwood, and other softwood, we have a, quite a surplus. Um, we have a significant and sustainable sur uh, surplus of spruce and fir. And in the case of spruce and fir, we could be talking about a significant large new consumer, uh, a large facility in Maine. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, even with a severe budworm outbreak, there's still surplus spruce fir fiber available going forward based on this modeling. We have enough additional hardwood fiber available to support facility expansions. Um, I don't think looking at that data that we have, uh, that we could support another whole pulp mill, I don't think. Uh, and I want to just mention that we need to remember that a model is only as good as its assumptions. Uh, my introduction, in my introduction, it was mentioned that I've been on a few, done a few uh, wood supply studies. I've worked on them for the state of Maine. And the early ones I did back in the 80s turned out to be spectacularly wrong, uh, not because the models were fatally flawed. They actually were pretty accurate in predictions of growth, but because our assumptions about what the industry was going to do consumption-wise were wrong because we didn't know. So that's why I mentioned earlier, this, this particular run we did assumes management stays the same for the next 50 years. That's not an outlandish assumption, but it's probably incorrect. The, the industry will change going forward. So um, I always mention that because one should look at modeling results as guides and as numbers or projections with deltas associated with them, errors, both due to the underlying assumptions and uh, the equations that you're using, and that um, I, I just caution people not to use them as, as exact numbers, because they're not. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Well done, Peter. So I think generally a, a good story here. We have a green, renewable, well-sustained uh, resource that I think is, is opportunities, as well as the, all the other benefits that, that the forest serves. A question or two for Peter, and again, we'll we'll move to Adam, and then and then Brian, and have a general discussion as well. We have a couple but, questions in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Ann. Oh, sure. Um, did the modeling factor include any climate change related impacts, or are those too difficult to estimate? That was from Keith Bisson at CEI. Uh, it did, the modeling did not include uh, climate change impacts, uh, largely because they're still, it would have overcomplicated uh, what we were trying to do here because there are both positive and negative impacts from climate change that are potential there. So the, uh, the short answer is no, we did not. Great, and uh, Adam, your co-panelist, does sustainable imply that the growth removal ratio equals one? It would if the inventories ended up exactly where they are today. But if you look at spruce fir, and it will be in the report, I don't have the uh, charts here, spruce fir ends up at a higher inventory than where it started. So the, the, the growth to harvest ratio was positive. Uh, hardwood is slightly higher, not quite as much. Other softwood ended up in our modeling to be pretty much dead even. So that would be a one-to-one. And one more. I'm wondering if there are potential changes in composition that are concerns or opportunities, also from Keith. Um, you know, if as climate warms, if it warms a lot more, certainly species composition will change over time. If we look at the main forest a thousand years ago, it was skewed much more to hemlock and oak and pine and much less to spruce fir, uh, based on the work that George Jacobson did. Um, I don't think though in a 50 year projection that that will be a significant impact. If we, if we model over a hundred years, it will, but our forests grow slowly enough. At the end of 50 years, we may see regeneration, seedlings and saplings of a different composition than we see today. But the commercial forest is basically baked in from this point going forward for the next 50 years. Great, I think that's a perfect segue to Adam Dagno. Uh, the University of Maine has done some research and is currently doing research on potential climate change impacts on the forest. And I believe Adam will talk to some of that now. 
Okay, thanks, Aaron. Uh, thanks, Peter. That was great. We didn't uh, we didn't we didn't talk too much about exactly uh, aligning, but I think uh, mine is going to build nicely uh, off of yours, um, which which is exactly what we want. So, hello, everyone. I'm Adam Dagno, uh, professor uh, University in Maine, and today the focus is going to be on um, basically how do we quantify natural climate solutions for Maine's working forests. Um, so. Uh, Talking a little bit about some of the, I'll, I'll try to address some of the questions that actually were just raised uh, with, with our work. So uh, for those of you who might've heard this buzzword, natural climate solutions sort of been around for the last four or five years. What exactly is that? Well, it's just really a fancy word or phrase for any management, uh, uh, any action that basically conserves or stores or improves the use of management of forests, wetlands, grasslands, and aglands while simultaneously increasing carbon storage or avoiding greenhouse gases. So when we think about forests, we're really about things like protecting forests or preventing them from being converted to other uses, uh, uh, basically improving our management to do more, basically get higher yields and as a result, higher biomass and more carbon out of our timberlands or taking land that was previously uh, uh, forested and restoring them. So making uh, land that was previously forest back into forest again. So, you know, and the reason within Maine that we're so interested in this is that forests themselves, you know, we know this is why we're all here today. Maine has an abundance of forests, you know, close to 90% of our landscape is forested, depending on, you know, what exactly what, what metric you use. And over the last sort of uh, 20 years, 30 years, what we've seen is Maine's uh, basically ability for the, our forest growth. And that's why I was asking Peter about sustainability, basically net growth in forests is greater than removal. So we're seeing more and more biomass, higher inventory in that forest, in our forest, which is thereby leading to higher amounts of carbon and higher amounts of carbon sequestration, which is helping uh, basically Maine uh, overall reduce its net emissions. So roughly by our estimates, about 70% of uh, Maine's greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted year on year is actually sequestered by the forest growing year on year in Maine. All right, so that that's basically a, 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 a very high number. It's basically on some one of the top three states in the country in terms of the amount of our forests contribute to meeting our, our, our sort of overall net uh, emissions um, uh, targets. Again, this is a very interest, uh, very much of an interest uh, because uh, of the recent um, proposals that have come out of both the Mills administration and the Maine legislature, which is basically has this ultimately this goal of reducing gross greenhouse gases. Uh, by 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. The big green line basically shows us where we are today. So Maine is very much on that trajectory towards meeting that goal, but obviously there's still a lot more to go. All right, but with that, that's all about gross greenhouse gas emissions. That's about what's basically coming out of our tailpipes, our factories, uh, and our furnaces. All right, if you include the aspect of forestry in particular, Right, Maine. Then we have this goal that was set by uh, executive order by Governor Mills in uh, 2019 to be net neutral by 2045. So we have to think about again over the long run. Right now, Maine's forests are doing a nice job at basically bringing our figure closer to five million metric tons per year. All right, um, and so what can Maine's forests continue to do to help bring us uh, down to that 2045 goal? All right, so with that as motivation, the questions that we have to consider is sort of what management practices or natural climate solutions are appropriate for Maine's forests? How much more carbon can be sequestered in Maine's forest and harvested wood products compared to today? And is it possible to join the increase both carbon and timber supply, right? So often you really think about in this world that, well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, we just need to continue to increase biomass on the stand, right? But one way that people think about that is just basically let trees grow longer. Right? But if you're letting all trees grow longer by a decade or two, right, that's going to reduce our timber supply. So is there a way that we can jointly meet both objectives, you know, which are you know, uh, you know, be, be, being the one that just Peter talked about, about this timber supply, right? that's going to be a major concern of those who are interested in the four main initiatives and, and the forest products industry. All right, so with that, there's some practices that we can consider. All right, and so with Maine, you can think about things about avoided deforestation. So there's about 10,000 acres per year of Maine's forests are converted to alternative use. Um, we can aforest or reforest some of the area in Maine. We estimate roughly 400,000 acres is sort of has the potential to be reforested without necessarily taking away from sort of primary crop production. All right, so think about marginal grasslands, uh, hay fields, things like that. 
Uh, you could take working forests now and sort of put them into permanent set-asides or conversion or ecological reserves, right? So remove harvesting altogether. Uh, you know, the, you can take uh, existing forests and basically change the management such that the sort of extend the rotation. So the sort of distribution of, of, the, of, of the sort of age classes within those forests are lengthened. Or you can actually do more intensive sort of uh, improved plantations or in a way other intermediate treatments that essentially, you know, take what your growing stock is and make that grow, uh, grow faster or, or take sort of the, the stock that you have, the land that you have and, and grow more out of that. So to do that, um, you know, what we're doing is exploring those options and more. And what we really want to do is not just look at the carbon potential, but look at also the timber potential. And then what are the costs of achieving that, right? So if you change your management, it might cost more, right? If you extend your rotation, it might result in uh, changes in the uh, sort of um, your harvest potential and the revenue you're earning. And so we really want to measure those costs and benefits. So the key costs we want to consider are things like opportunity costs, capital or equipment, and labor that you might need if you're changing your practices, uh, maintenance on that stand. And there could be other environmental costs associated with the trade-off of sort of how you're managing that landscape. Could be trade-offs in things like, like habitat, for example. On the benefits, you know, the key motivation behind a natural climate solution is to improve increase carbon sequestration. If you're actually doing uh, more management, you might actually get yield improvements. Uh, if you're thinking about sort of incentives to get carbon, um, you know, increased carbon, then there you might enter into carbon markets, which could be diversified income. You know, again, what you're what you're doing, you might actually result in cost savings uh, through this management. You know, getting getting uh, you know basically either different you know, species distribution, age class distribution might result in an increased value, and there might be other environmental co benefits that 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 gener that are generated as a result. And so to do that, what we've done is basically taken a forest landscape model and applied it to the 9.1 million acres in northern Maine. So this is largely the sort of you know, primary commercially uh, owned and, and managed forest um, at the northern half of the state. Uh, the resolution is 30 meters, so it's very quite fine. And we're looking at estimating this out to 2100. I'm not going to talk about the results today, but sort of in some reports, we have a bit more on it. And so um, that builds on one of the uh, one of the questions is about, you know, what is the impact of climate? And we're looking at the impact of both severe and mild climate change on what sort of these, uh, these different practices might look like, including species distribution. On the economic side, we're looking at planting management opportunity costs. And in carbon sequestration, we're looking at net forest growth, so what's growing out on the landscape relative to sort of today or a baseline. But we're also looking about the of carbon that can be stored in harvested wood products albeit um, you know, saw log grade, pulp wood grade, right? And then uh, what, where those might end up, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, in, in, such as in a landfill. Speaking of uh, carbon sequestration, Adam, we have a question yep. in the chat um, and also wanna let you know, you have about two minutes. Uh, right. Do any of the forest owners monetize carbon sequestration credits as in starting with kelp forests? Yep. So there's um, roughly about three to four percent of Maine's landscape. Uh, uh, there's people who are in, uh, enrolled in carbon credit programs of some sort. So it's it's nascent, but it, it, it's definitely possible. Thank you. Yep. All right. So what I'm going to do is just basically get to the results. But uh, to point out that basically in this model, we're looking at uh, something like 13 different species that account for roughly, you know, 90 plus percent of the sort of biomass in the forest. Um, in that northern half. And here's the kicker, right? So uh, if you look at those different practices, the ones that are red are the ones that were expected to have the greatest gains, all right, uh, because they result in increased growth in yield, all right? And so basically the ones we're gonna get the most is increasing more uh, sort of clear cut plus plantation style. Um, and, but if you're concerned about the sort of the ecological integrity associated with clear cuts, right, which it lead to improved productivity because you're basically having a lot more um, sort of spruce, spruce out there relative to mixed stands, you can also add a certain amount of set-asides or ecological reserves to help counter some of the effects or have this dual approach. And ultimately what we're seeing is you can get upwards of two to three million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is very much similar to what you would need to sort of reach, uh, you know, maybe three quarters of that last remaining gap. For context, Maine's forests now roughly sequester 12 million uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. 
All right, and all this can be done relatively cheaply, something at the rough uh, line of $20 per ton of carbon or less. Now, the last thing I just wanna point out is that what we're also doing here is that, you know, I didn't tell you a lot about sort of the trade-off between carbon uh, uh, in the landscape and that in wood products. And so we've just recently done sort of three levels of timber demand. Look at sort of if markets such as the four main, you know, the, the four main initiative sort of gets carried out in the amount of, uh, of wood that Peter thinks can, can sustainably be harvested, right? We're ramping harvests up more than what they are sort of today or historically. And so you'd have to look at sort of what the trade off there is with carbon. All right, so the results I presented on the previous slide uh, basically were this middle one, right? And so the brown is harvested wood products. So that means relative to the baseline or current, you are seeing somewhat of a reduction in, in harvest, roughly around the line of five to 10% compared to today, right? If you go to a higher timber demand where we try to stimulate more and more demand compared to current, there are ways that you can actually get more carbon and more wood out of our, out of our landscape Right, but you have to shift to more intensive forestry, at least in part of the state. All right, and so that's the way that you sort of have to get sort of, uh, you know, basically to jointly meet both objectives. And then that's basically it. Just to summarize, you know, really that's a mix of intensive harvesting, planting, and set asides can allow us to sort of increase carbon and, and, and potentially also achieve um, the, the, the goals of, of, of maintaining or increase uh, harvest as well. Um, with this, there's sort of a minimal amount of, of sort of loss to the, to the industry, right? But we have to be creative in terms of, of, of getting there. And costs are relatively cheap compared to a lot of, uh, a lot of other sort of non-forest-based uh, carbon credits or, or, or um, allowances that you might see, such as for renewable energy, uh, et cetera. And so I think I'll just leave it at that. I just want to note that we have a, um, uh, the slides themselves, which will be posted, have a, have a link to the report and everything else where you can get a lot more detail uh, in this space. Thank you. That's great, Adam. Um, I do want to let everyone know that I just received a message. We're going to extend our session by five minutes, which really helps us out. Um, it's happening across the whole program today. So just to let you know, we now have time uh, to have a few questions for Adam. And there are some in the chat. Um, Adam, uh, from Peter, besides increasing site biomass, does harvesting mortality and putting it into long-lived products play a role? So I think we're mostly focused on uh, harvesting, uh, basically, well, it's just about harvesting biomass. I don't think we differentiate between whether it's live or dead. Um, Aaron might have more insight on that because he's worked with the model before about how we distinguish between that, but it's, it's, a, good, it's a good question. Um, it's yeah, something to probably that. account for in the future if it's not explicitly in here. I, I meant harvesting live wood before it dies. So removing it before, before mortality occurs. Right, so that's that's explicitly sort of, uh, I guess, the rule that we have within there. I mean, this yeah. this model has been used to look at spruce budworm and things like that, so so it does have the capabilities to do that. Thank you. Great. Um, from Lou, how does your model treat residues from harvesting and forest products manufacturing? Yep. So um, we harvest basically whole, whole whole logs and basically account for uh, basically yeah. It's all about where you sort of put the pools. So uh, you know we harvest we harvest you know whole logs that's brought basically to the mill and then that's where I apportion it out based on the product distribution. So we do account for residues uh, in both cases. Right now we just assume that those sort of residues are are, are basically have zero value. We can think about that in the case of like four main, there would be some value there. All right. So from a carbon accounting perspective, that's really where the most, where basically lies the, in, in the, the uh, uh, most important case here, I guess, is that it just assumes that just it, it's combusted or decays immediately, right? If there's ways that we can convert that into something else, and that's another way that we can ramp up harvested wood product carbon because those residues are being sort of utilized or stored in an, in an alternative. Great. Right. And the last question, could you please elaborate some on where you clear cut and plant to achieve these scenarios? And does it matter which stands or sites you select? Yep, so Jeremy, that's a good question. So um, basically, you know, there is some site quality uh, uh, within the model. So it, it basically will establish, you know, if, if the land is eligible. So 
The only thing that can be cut and clear cut is if it reaches a certain criteria that, that is meeting, you know, when you'd go in and harvest a stand now, which is on average something like 50 years, right? And it says if it's of certain site quality, right? And we want to, and basically we have a, a goal to have a certain amount uh, of acres uh, planted every year, then it's going to basically find, um, you know, a certain proportion of the uh, stand that's harvested year on year that can then go in and do it based on the highest site quality and potential that to, to, in this, in our case, we, we assume that it was going to be a, a spruce based plantation. Great. I'm going to turn it back to Aaron and Aaron, um, feel free to share what you've put in the chat. Yep, so I just uh, provided a link to the larger report. Um, this is still an ongoing effort that Adam and myself and others are involved with. So if you have feedback on the scenarios we're doing or things that you would like to see, um, we continue to move this forward. So we would welcome that input. I would just echo Jeremy's statement about the clear cutting and planting. It's not 50 or 33% of the landscape that's being clear cut. It's basically 50 or 33% of the annual harvest is being clear cut. So basically three to 5% of the total landscape would, would be in clear cuts. Uh, so it's an important distinction. Now, to finally round this off, I would like to turn it over to Brian to talk a little bit about the production side of things. So Brian. Well, thank you very much. Uh, nice job, Adam and Peter. Of course, uh, it's a privilege to be part of this important discussion with so many outstanding individuals. So my life's work has been literally in Maine's forest. Uh, my daughter, Whitney, along with the seasoned leadership team here, expect to uh, work in Maine's forest indefinitely. So we kind of have a major stake in this game. The event this morning is testimony to the importance of Maine's forest in the future bioeconomy. Uh, and, and to supply that bioeconomy, we're gonna need a few things. We're gonna need, um, we will need uh, sustainable forest growth, of course, which is a big part of this conversation. We're gonna continue continued access to that fiber. Uh, and then we're gonna need reliable professional suppliers. So that's where my uh, discussion will focus is today on the suppliers. The professional logging contractors of Maine uh, thankfully started us on the right path in 2000, the year 2000, as they birthed the Master Logger Certified Program. This was the world's first third party point of harvest certification of logging suppliers, harvesting practices, a commitment to the Master Logger Performance Standards, and a proven smart logging auditing process. Uh, very important. And so master logger certified companies are guided by nine goals. Um, number one, appropriate harvest planning, then protecting water quality, maintaining uh, soil productivity, sustaining forest ecosystems, managing aesthetics, ensuring workplace safety, demonstrating continuous improvement and ensuring business viability and upholding the, and, and up, uh, lastly but not least, upholding the integrity of the certificate itself. So um, as, you, as you see, it's compre uh, a comprehensive list for sure. So it's an, it's, uh, it is a significant process and the cost for a logging supplying company to become master logger certified. There's interviews, there's background checks, reference checks, there's a rigorous field audit performed by trained independent licensed foresters and more. The certification board consists of state representatives, university faculty, retired professional loggers, uh, and an environmental attorney. Uh, so these folks then review and ultimately decide on certification uh, of, of um, companies that are applying for that. So once certified, a company must submit annual business and harvest data uh, and is subject to field audits. There are random audits and anonymous 800 number that public can call to report any concerning activities. Um, this is really uh, an important part of the whole process as we move forward. Treeline became master logger certified in 2002 and being certified has resulted in elevating our company as we work to uphold the high standards required by certification. Master logger certification has also made it possible to differentiate ourselves uh, in the marketplace from suppliers that choose not to become certified. It is important to remember that the public meets Maine's forest industry in the forest, which is where logging suppliers live and work. 
So main uh, master logger certification provides crucial on the ground verification of criteria that's critical to the integrity and most importantly, the image of our industry to the public. In Maine, five and a half million tons of wood were harvested by master logger certified companies in 2019, which represents 42% of all wood that was harvested in Maine. On a bigger picture, um, master logger certification is now recognized in 20 states uh, throughout the US and also internationally in Canada, uh, Colombia, Estonia, and Japan. Um, interestingly enough, master logger is now being used as the basis for a new global forest contractor certification program with founding members in the US, Sweden, Finland, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. So master logger has now been recognized by the two most notable forest certification systems in North America, which is Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, and the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, SFI. Master logger uh, certification has been recognized by the Maine Climate Council in terms of being a program that could support uh, climate mitigation. So currently there's a high global demand for certified fiber. However, only 38% of the land base and 40% of the timber harvesting capacity in Maine are currently certified to a third party standard. I don't have to tell you about all the challenges of running a viable professional logging business. I think you know the issues. Uh, many of them are being talked about today. There's labor, there's capital, uh, advancing technology, training uh, needs, insurance uh, issues, environmental issues, uh, and, a, and a lot more. Uh, they're all complex issues uh, without easy solutions. However, having a reliable professional logging suppliers uh, workforce out there is paramount to supplying Maine's future forest bioeconomy, which is what this morning's all about. A strong third-party audited certified program will help by raising the bar across Maine's forest suppliers and certified logging companies will play an essential role to ensuring an adequate supply of certified fiber to meet the demand created by Maine's future forest bioeconomy. So I'll thank you for your time and interest. It's uh, on this important topic uh, now and in the future. I certainly look forward to your questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, one quick question from Pat Bond was, what are the primary factors that deter companies from being master logger certified? The barriers, barriers to companies. Okay. Um, well, I would say cost resources in general. I would say a lot of logging uh, suppliers are small uh, family operations. Um, so there, there's a significant cost uh, to the application process. There's a cost to maintaining your certification, both in uh, financially and just uh, general business resources. And then Peter uh, asked, does the logging industry have adequate access to capital to keep their equipment and businesses <laughs> healthy? Uh, I, <laughs> when people ask me that quite question in general, I, I, my, my uh, customary answer is I've never had any trouble borrowing money. It's paying back, paying back the money. That's been the challenge over the years. Um, I would say, you know, for established logging suppliers, the answer would be yes. Certainly for uh, upstarts, the answer would be no or probably not. Okay. Any quick questions for Brian or the other panelists? I think we're about two minutes away from the end of this session. I really appreciate everyone's participation. Obviously there's a complex set of issues, but I think in general, this is a very good story to tell, um, particularly as we think about green products and renewable resources, particularly in a carbon neutral economy. So I'm, I'm something that we're proud of and, and excited to see. So a quick question from Gordon Gamble, um, interest in climate change goals. Uh, how do you consider the carbon impacts of conversion or land conversion for, for um, solar or wind? Right, so that, that's, that's a good question. Um, basically, and it, it's very heated, right? There's a lot of, a lot of discussion around solar siting and things like that. Um, you know, that basically in our world that would, capture we i didn't talk about it much but i do talk about the price of avoided conversion 
and and the relative value or the amount that you'd have to pay to keep sort of uh, land in forests relative to something that's developed, right? And I would consider a solar, you know, a solar site to be developed would be would be quite high. Um, so so in terms of uh, competition, it's something that we have to be aware of. Um, but but it, it might be that that some forests could uh, could be lost uh, as a result of that, just because of the relative value of of one versus the other. Um, from that perspective, even even taking into account the carbon that's lost, recalling that a lot of that carbon that's quote unquote lost is stored in products to some degree. It's not like you just cut the land and 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 just burn all the wood, right? So you also have to take that factor into account. It's a great question, though, Gordon. And I think that's the big thing that we've noticed is just accounting for the products and where they go um, and how much actually comes out of the forest is not as easy as, as it may seem. And so I think that's where some of the needs are is just better tracking the life cycle of these products and uh, logs move around and, and shift and get, get uh, processed in very different ways. All right, we're 30 seconds. Any other quick questions? I won't have any brilliant uh, thoughts to leave us on, but I just really appreciate everyone's participation and um, involvement with this effort. It's been great to see it reach this point. So uh, thank you, everyone.